Hi, students, and welcome to today's live IELTS class. My name is Adrian, and I'm streaming to you from beautiful Budapest. Hi, Veer Paul. Hi, Prashant. Hi, Lydia. Hi, Just Paul. Nice to see many students in the class today. And we will be focusing on the listening section, specifically part three and four, the more challenging parts of the listening section. And of course, the materials are coming from our websites, and we will use them today, aehelp.com, for the academic version of the exam. And for the general, check us out at g-i-e-l-t-s-help.com. That's generalieltshelp.com. On both of our websites, we have lots and lots of great materials to help you practice, improve, and get higher band scores this is our academic website here with the blue background. Click that big red button to join. And this is our general one here with the green background. Click that big red button uh, to join us there. Hi, Janiel. Hi, Carolina. Nice to see our members joining in on the class as well. If you have questions, students, uh, you can always send me an email, adrian at aehelp.com. Uh, tomorrow, we'll have more classes that will be speaking part two and three, so make sure to tune in for those also. And of course, if you haven't done this yet, uh, you can get our apps, Academic IELTS Help, from your app store or General IELTS Help, and you can link the app to your web account uh, for some really good um, learning. All right, everyone, let's get into... Uh, today's listening. Now, yesterday I had a little bit of audio issue. I'm trying to fix that. It's really hard to pinpoint what that is. Anyhow, if the audio is not clear, let me know. Now, that means if you hear distortion or fuzz, just let me know. If it's quiet, then turn up the volume or use a headset, okay? And please don't write your answers into the chat. Uh, write them into a separate document, and then we'll go through the answers at the end together. So don't spoil the fun for your classmates, keep the answers to yourself, and then afterwards we will do it together, okay? So I know the audio is good right now, but it seems to distort when, uh, when the listening starts. I don't know what's causing that, but anyway, I think it's some Wi-Fi interference or something. But anyhow, let's hope that doesn't happen today. I made some adjustments. Um, so for the audio, uh, we're just gonna hop over to our website here and uh, get that going. I'm just gonna go into my student account and if you have access to our premium package, of course, make sure to use the audio for your listening as well. Uh, make sure you have a piece of paper or a separate document ready here. So we're gonna start in just one moment. Okay. All right, so hopefully everybody's ready. Hopefully the microphone participates. I know the screen is bright because it's uh, a bright screen right now, but I'll change that in just one second. Here we go. Now turn to section three. Take some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Listening, section three. You will hear a forum discussion between the moderator and two contributors, Dr. Rachel Young and Dr. Ronald Sturgeon, both political scientists at the local university, talking about trade between countries. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. First of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Young and Dr. Sturgeon for taking the time to spend this afternoon with us. Thank you for having us here today. Dr. Young, could you give us a little background on the topic of free trade and protectionism, a little history? Well, countries and nation states have been participating in free trade schemes for millennia. The ancient Egyptians, for example, participated in trade with the Arabians across the Red Sea over 3000 years ago. The Roman Empire imported many goods from outside their lands, especially luxury goods such as silk, which were only available in China. 
Free trade, however, though, has much younger roots. Could you define free trade and protectionism for us, Dr Sturgeon? Free trade is trade between countries without taxes, tariffs or other regulations attached. Without a free trade agreement, nations charge taxes or tariffs on goods that are imported to their country. This is to protect the manufacturers within their country. If country A, for example, produces a product for a 20% higher cost than country B, country A is likely to impose a tariff on the importation of country B's cheaper product into country A. This is to level the playing field for domestic manufacturers. Free trade advocates want to take down this barrier. In my opinion, advocates of free trade do not care about domestic manufacturers and workers in their own country. I believe their only intention is to maximise profit for big international businesses. I know Dr Sturgeon is impassioned about protectionism, but what he fails to mention is that while free trade may lead to some lost jobs in certain sectors, it leads to many other jobs in other sectors. This may be cold comfort to those in, say, manufacturing or textiles, but we must not be blind to the needs of the many and be distracted by the needs of the few. Nobody says free trade between countries is perfect, but it is certainly better than a protectionist framework which costs the country jobs and prosperity. Another point I would like to make is that free trade increases competition and thus lowers the price of many goods. This saves consumers money. Purchasing a car, for example, is much cheaper under free trade agreements. While such agreements may appear undesirable for a British company such as Land Rover, since they are given price disadvantage within the United Kingdom, this is not the whole story. While it is true that the company is at a minor disadvantage within their home country, free trade agreements puts them in an equally advantageous position in other countries in which the UK has a free trade agreement. You now have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 27 to 30. This is a very interesting discussion. Dr Sturgeon, from reading some of your work, I know you have some ethical concerns about free trade. Yes, I have a number of ethical concerns. First and foremost, free trade agreements incentivize highly unethical sweatshops. When countries such as the United Kingdom enter free trade agreements with countries with lower human rights standards, we put ourselves at risk of tacitly endorsing those low human rights standards. Is the ability to wear slightly cheaper clothing really worth selling out on one of our most basic beliefs, that people should be treated with respect? I agree with Dr Sturgeon that human rights is an ongoing issue in free trade. Certain incidents, such as sweatshops collapsing and killing dozens of workers, have highlighted this issue in the media and public discourse, but these are isolated incidents. Hardly. These are not isolated at all. And even if such horrible incidents were rare, does it make the conditions those workers work in permissible? Do we excuse horrible working conditions as long as the workers don't die? That's an incredibly low bar, and one I believe we must implore companies and governments to raise. OK, OK, let's move on. Dr Young, do you believe free trade betters the life of the average British citizen? Absolutely. I believe free trade agreements make us more prosperous as a society. While not perfect, I truly believe pursuing free trade agreements is a positive step in making our world a better place. Of course I disagree. While I do not doubt that more wealth comes into our country as a result of free trade agreements, I believe this money never improves the life of the average citizen. The rich get richer and the middle class workers get laid off. Not to mention the ethical issues I have with this. That is the end of section three. You will now have half a minute to check your answers.
Okay, students, again, make sure to use that half minute to check your answer as always. Look for uh, spelling mistakes, misreading the instructions, look for plural singular, missing S's in your answers. Definitely take that 30 seconds to review your answers while the information is fresh in your mind. Okay, let's go through the answers uh, together as a group, okay? Uh, and um, I'll give you some tips and some strategies as we go along. So of course, tip number one, always pay attention to the instructions. One word or two word or three words. So here, write no more than one word for each answer. It's just one question. So how long ago was the first record it record of trade between nations and all you need here is one number uh, because you have the word years here so when you see this one word um, then uh, one number will also suffice okay and i see a lot of you are saying oh that number is three thousand yeah so um dr young i believe says that the first record of trade is three thousand uh, years ago Okay, between the Egyptians and Arabs, I believe, is uh, what he mentioned. So all you need here is the number. Don't write 3,000. Just write the number. It's fine. Okay, even though it says word there, they'll take the number. Uh, question 22, 23, and 24. It's a little bit of a flow chart. Uh, students, when you get this type of a flow chart question... Uh, pay attention to unique type information that helps you position yourself in the audio. So here the unique information is country A, 20%, and country B. So in the audio, there's many ways for these speakers to say the words produces, makes, for example, or product, goods, merchandise, okay? Um, but the number 20%, there's really only one way to say it. It's 20%, and that will help you position, okay? So once you hear this, you know that the answers will be coming. There's actually a little bit of chatter uh, among the speakers before they got uh, to these answers. So you have to be patient. Don't rush, okay? Um, here it is. So a company in country A imports the product. If the country does not have a free trade agreement, the company must pay us something to import the product. This is to level. Okay, so what's number 22? All right, uh, so many of you are saying tariff. I saw a couple people say tariffs. Uh, be very careful. So again, the correct answer here is tariff. Okay, tariff is synonymous with tax. And notice how you have the uh, article a uh, here. So there's no S. Okay, if you write an S, you'll get it wrong. So one way that you can uh, make sure that doesn't happen is check to see if there's an article. If there's an article that lets you know that you're writing a noun in its singular form, okay? So uh, Catherine Pang, taxes. They might take tax, Lydia, that's right. So Lydia Gurgis is asking, do they take tax? Um, yeah, they will take a perfect synonym. So if you write tax, they'll take that. Okay, a tariff is a tax, but not if you write taxes, okay? Because again, that's the plural. Uh, now, careful with the synonyms. The only time they will accept a synonym like that is if it's a perfect synonym. In this case, tax and tariff are perfect synonyms, okay? It would be incorrect to mark that wrong. Okay, uh, this is to level the playing field four. Now here, for number 23, uh, it was two words, so remember this one here says two words. When the instructions say two words, it's likely that some answers will be two words. And Samuel says it's domestic manufacturers, and that's correct, okay? Uh, domestic manufacturers. Okay, nice long word. Uh, now, if you don't know the spelling of these, try to write them as best as you can, and hopefully you'll see that word somewhere uh, in the listening, which will help you to spell it. I don't think you do in this case, but that's one way. Uh, domestic, by the way, uh, for all of you uh, that might not know this word, uh, domestic means local, local manufacturers, okay? 
So domestic manufacturers. Now here, uh, the S is important. This is a plural, okay? So S is compulsory, Priyanka, yes. Uh, if you don't have an S, then um, you will get it wrong. Uh, remember, students, that in part three and part four, uh, you are using a much higher level of English comprehension and writing than in uh, part one and two. So you have to pay more attention to detail, okay? There's more places in part three and part four to make mistakes, right? Okay, um, if the countries do not or do have a free trade agreement, the company does not have to pay the import or pay to import the item. Uh, some advocates, advocates means supporters of protectionism, believe free trade advocates are only worried about maximizing something for large companies. So what is the answer for number 24? So what are they maximizing for large companies? And logic might help you figure this out as well. So Samuel says profits, uh, Alak Khadir says profit. Um, so maximizing profit or profits. In this case, uh, the noun profit can be plural, profits. And in this context, both are correct because uh, plural or singular is correct grammar. But be careful, that's kind of a lucky one. It's not always like that. So in most situations, it's either plural or singular. Okay, so here the answer was uh, profits, right, for large companies. So if you had profit, it's okay. Profits is okay too. All right, so now we had some fill-in-the-blank uh, questions that you had to uh, figure out. Um, and I see uh, Raghav is saying, S is perplexing always. It can be, Raghav, I agree with you. Uh, even for native speakers, the plural singular is perplexing, especially because we have irregular plurals in English also. Uh, one way students to get a better handle on plural singulars is to do a lot of reading, okay? Um, all right, so here we go. Write no more than three words and or a number for each answer. Uh, number 25, some people will lose their jobs under free trade agreements, but we must emphasize the needs of the something and not be sidetracked by the needs of the something. So in this case, you have two words. The order is very important. So in your answer sheet for number 25, you'd have your answer sheet like this. Of course, in the computer-based exam, you just write it in. In the paper-based exam, you'd have it like this, and you have to write it in a very specific way. And I can see uh, many of you. Uh, perplex means, uh, Shivani, perplexing means confusing, uh, challenging to figure out. Um, okay, so the answer here is many, comma, few. That's right. So in space number 25 on your answer sheet, you'd have your answers like that. Okay, if you have it, opposite if you have few many uh, be really careful with that you'll get that wrong okay um, and these can be small letters many few okay they're just uh, common nouns all right uh, make sure you don't actually put few into the next question into 26 i've seen uh, people do that as well okay all right so far so good uh number 26 uh, free trade lowers the price of many goods because it increases something. Now, again, logic can help you figure this out without even listening. So if you miss an answer, don't panic. Oftentimes, using good critical thinking, your own knowledge, you can guess this. Okay. All right. Uh, Samuel, our member, says that one should be competition. The game agrees. Un, sorry, Un, I know Un's your first name. Un agrees it's competition. Uh, Bebek agrees as well, and indeed it is. And anybody who uh, studies a bit of economics, and I don't mean university, just high school level economics, we know this answer is competition. Okay, so when you have free trade, there's more competition among the companies, right? So um, it lowers the price of products. Okay, all right, so now we're on to the second half of the audio, 
we had this table that we needed to fill out here. Uh, it's no more than one word. Again, it's just one word and pay attention to the columns. This is the cause and the effect. And again, they took a little bit of time to get to these answers. So you have to be patient sometimes. In part three and part four, uh, sometimes you have to be patient to wait for the answer. Sometimes the answers come quickly. That's a little bit different from part one and two in the listening. In part one and two of the listening, the answers are usually a little bit more uh, spread out evenly. But in part three and four, they're more um, random. Okay, So pay attention to this information as well. And especially keywords like this, sweatshops collapse. Again, there's not a lot of ways to say sweatshops, so that's kind of a key word that you can listen for. Um, highlighted is also used in the audio, so here if you caught that word, great. But that's not something that you might hear, so that can be paraphrased by saying emphasized, okay, for example. So careful with that. So sweatshops collapse, the conditions are highlighted in the, uh, someone deep says, I think that's the media, yeah. Now, media here works, okay? Um, if you write news, you'll get that wrong. News is not accurate enough of a paraphrase. So unlike previously where I said, you know, tax or tariff, both would be okay. Um, but here, media is the better word, yeah. And real diamond, yeah, small letters are okay. For any common nouns, small letters are okay. So the realization that such incidents are not isolated, okay? Not isolated means they happen in different places. Uh, implore companies. Implore means to strongly motivate or push companies and something to raise the bar, okay? Uh, King Kumir says governments. Pawandeep says government. Uh, Samuel says governments. Uh, notice how there's a lot of variance in your answers between the plural and the singular. Um, how can I figure out if this is a plural or a singular? Can anybody tell me that before? So how do I know if it's government, single, or governments, plural? How can I figure that out for sure, even without the audio? There's definitely a way. Yeah, so Samuel says, well, look at uh, the previous noun companies uh, with an S, right? Real Diamond says that too. Look at companies. Yeah, um, usually in English, when you have a list of nouns that are joined together with and, uh, their uh, plural singulars are the same. So if this is plural, this should be plural as well. So companies, very good. Governments. Okay, with an S. No S, no point. Okay, keep that in mind. So uh, using the other parts of the sentence is the way to figure out usually whether it's plural or singular. Okay. All right, let's look at 29 to 30. So these are multiple choice, and I know that this is one of the most challenging um, types of questions in the listening, especially in part three and four where you have a lot of information. So it's not just one word for each choice, but you have whole sentences here that you have to choose from. What's the correct strategy to figure out the right answers for these? So how do you, how do you uh, get the correct answer in the listening so you're not freaking out? What should you do? Okay. So what do you need to do? What can you do? What's the right way? Anybody know? I'll give you a suggestion. I'm just seeing if anybody is picking that up from previous classes. I have mentioned it, and I'm sure some of our students have heard me say this. So Samuel says, summarize beforehand the options. Lydia says, look at the keywords. Shaikh Fazil, I like your answer the most so far. Shaikh Fazil says, listen. Uh, An says, don't get confused by the choices. Tenzin says, read only the question. Carolina says, take some notes. Yeah, Carolina, I like yours and Fazil's. Take notes and listen. Um, yeah, so uh, when you have this type of a question, there is no way uh, for you to figure this out by looking at the choices. There's too much information here, and what's going to happen is the answer will be said before you can even read and figure out what these choices are, OK? 
Okay, so I'll give you a couple notes on this and then we'll um, give the right answer. Yeah, listen and analyze, uh, Shivan Jupiter. You're on the right track as well. Okay, so I'll give you a couple of points here, okay, on this. And then uh, we'll continue on. So, okay, so um, multiple choice questions in the listening, especially with long answer choices. Okay, number one, do not stare at the choices hoping to catch. Uh, keywords or understand them before the answer comes. I mean, hopefully during the review time, you got a little bit of an idea there. Okay. All right. Um, instead, what you do need to know is look at the question. Paraphrase it in your mind and think of it as a statement rather than a question uh, in order to prepare your ears to catch the info, okay? So what I mean here is um, when you hear what is Dr. Young's main point in advocating for free trade, uh, we're familiar with who Dr. Young is, hopefully by this time from the beginning. So most likely, if I look at this before I listen, in my mind, my best guess is what I'm going to hear is Dr. Young speaking and Dr. Young saying, um, I believe uh, free trade is important because, okay? and then some information that I'm listening for. This is what I'm listening for, okay? Does that make sense so far? So I look at the question and I simplify it into a statement that I believe I'm going to hear based on this question. Does that make sense? So is everybody clear on that? So rather than staring at this in the question format, which is much more challenging, because then I'm interpreting simultaneously. I interpret beforehand. So I go, okay, here this guy's gonna say, I believe free trade is important, or I believe free trade is the only way, or I believe uh, free trade is the best option, okay? So, and I'm listening for that kind of information. And then, you're right, Carolina, as soon as I hear some similar type of um, speaking at this point like this, then what I do, is take some notes, okay? And from what I heard, okay, that's because this could be paraphrased. So this could be uh, completely different words than what they actually say, okay? So then my next step is to catch that answer and to quickly take a note on it, okay, rather than reading through those. And of course, we know that very soon we'll have about 20 seconds to review these answers, okay? so. Uh, then, as soon as you hear the statement that you inferred from the question, write down quickly in short form or note form the answer. Okay? All right, um, what did he say? So don't give me uh, the uh, letter for this, so don't give me the answer, just tell me what he said. So what is Dr. Young's main point in advocating for free trade? So what does Dr. Young actually say uh, is uh, the reason we should all choose uh, free trade, okay? So here, on your question paper, right above it, just write down the answer that you're, that you're listening for, okay? I kind of caught it, and um, what I heard is he said something like, it's the best possible option. 
he said something like this. I, I don't remember his exact words, but he said something like, um, it's not perfect, but it works, so it's good, okay? Yeah, so Un, very good. So Nick Heyman is, is saying the same. So Un's saying, uh, free trade's not perfect, but something, right? Um, Shaik, yeah, it's not perfect, but something's good about it, right? So now what I want to do is I want to match the right answer that's the closest to this one. And I don't have to do that right away. So I can keep going. And then at the end, when I have uh, 20 seconds to look at my answers to make sure they're correct, in that time, I can choose the right answer because that's going to be a little bit more calm for me, especially since I know that these are the last two questions in the section. Does that make sense? So four, uh, don't rush to answer. Uh, wait for the 20 second review time and then match the closest uh, selection to what you uh, heard, okay? So that is going to be your best possible uh, solution or te technique uh, strategy uh, for this kind of uh, question, okay? So I go back and I go, okay, uh, free trade agreements are the single biggest economic driver in the world today. Uh, it's not really close. Uh, free trade agreements are not perfect, but they are a good step towards increasing welfare. It's the best possible option. This and this, yeah, they're pretty close. Okay, that, that makes sense. Uh, free trade, trade agreements are not always positive, but can be an important way to level the playing field for domestic manufacturers. Mm, okay, well, I didn't um, hear that, uh, so I don't think that's the right one. So I'm going to choose B. B is the closest match, and B is correct. Okay, so if you got B, that's fantastic. All right, uh, that's the strategy you want to use. Now, uh, C is actually some really good information. Why? Why is C useful? Not for this question, but it's useful for another reason. Why is C useful for me at this point? If I'm a very careful um, test taker and I'm using all kinds of good test taking strategies, why is, a, why is C a useful piece of, aha, very clever Samuel. So Samuel, uh, Sadir says, well, because it helps me for one of my previous blanks. And you're absolutely right. How, Samuel? Tell us. Do tell us because you're correct, so I'm sure you picked it up. How does it help me for my previous blank? And some of you are maybe cluing in now as well. You're going, oh, yeah, 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 wait a second. Adrian said something about that a few minutes ago. Yeah, very nice, Samuel. You get my super ultra thumbs up for today. Um, domestic manufacturers, yeah. Everybody remembers that was one of our answers for a previous uh, question. So if you didn't catch exactly the words domestic manufacturers, but you caught some similar sounding, so you realize that was the answer, but you don't know how to spell it, you weren't too sure about the answer, then now here you realize, oh, wait a second, that's exactly what they said, and that's the spelling. So here, uh, where is it? Yeah, all the way there for 23, the playing field for domestic manufacturers. This is to level the playing field for domestic manufacturers. And bada bing, bada boom, you have level the playing field for domestic manufacturers, right? So the spelling is there, but even the phrase is there to help you, okay? Staying calm, collected, using good strategy. Uh, IELTS is not just a test of English. It's a test of logic, quick, critical thinking. Absolutely. That will get you very far in life if you master those, okay? So keep it in mind. All right. Um, so 
The next one, last one here. What is Dr. Sturgeon's main point in advocating for protectionism? So here we're listening for something where Dr. Sturgeon is like, well, I think protectionism is better because, or the opposite where they might say, he might say something like, well, a free trade is not the best idea because protectionism is better because, so something like that. Um, and then here you should have again written down uh, some good information as well. Uh, something like uh, protectionism is more fair, is a fairer choice, or distributes money more evenly. This one was a little bit tricky, and the correct answer is C. Okay, so if you got C, you got it correct. It's an inverse, or it's the opposite way to uh, explain that, but it is correct. All right, so free trade agreements are bad because they concentrate wealth in the hands of a, an elite few. So that was a little bit more challenging. You had to think a bit outside the box in that case, but the answer was there. Okay. All right. Fantastic. Uh, how did you do? How did everybody um, do on that one? So what did you get out of 10 points or 10 questions uh, for this uh, part three? Okay, and I'll let you know if you're on track for a high band score or if you need to maybe go back a little bit to the drawing board and reinvent. Okay, so King Kumira says nine. Nine is good. Alex says seven. Seven's not bad at all. Uh, Shaikh says eight. Uh, eight is, is good. Ten, of course, Samuel is uh, fantastic. Um, six, Catherine is okay. All right, so if you are between six and ten, you are doing okay. Uh, if you're less than, okay, so if you're like five or uh, less than five, somewhere here, uh, then you need to uh, work on strategy and work on your listening. Otherwise, you will have a tough time getting over that band six, 6.5 mark, okay? If you're losing five points here. All right, so um, that's section three or part three. They call it part three now from 2020. They used to call it section. Now it's part three. Um, so uh, that's part three of the listening. Now we will go on to part four. Is everybody ready for part four? Everybody's uh, geared up for part four? Yeah? Okay. All right. Um, so let's do it. Let's do part four. Same thing. Uh, hopefully the audio stays clear for you. Uh, for those students who said the audio is quiet, it's max volume on my side. So please just turn up the volume on your end um, and use a headset. Okay. All right. Here we go uh, with part four. Everybody make sure to write your answers onto a separate sheet and then we'll go through them together after. Okay. So don't put them in the chat. Give everybody a fair chance. Okay. Uh, here we go with part four. Now turn to section four. Take some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listening section four. You will hear a university lecture on the famous artist Michelangelo. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good to see you all. As you know, we're having an exam a week from today. Material from today's class will be included on the exam, but material from the final two classes of the week will not be included. I hope this will give you an opportunity to revise enough to perform well on the exam. With that administrative business out of the way, I'd like to begin today's lecture on the lesser known works and endeavors of the famous Italian Renaissance artist, Michelangelo. While Michelangelo is best known for his painting of the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, he was also the creator of a number of other highly respected works. 
Among these are the Pieta, a statue of Mary holding a deceased Jesus, and the statue David, said to be the representative of the perfect male form. But Michelangelo was not just a painter and a sculptor. One of his crowning achievements is St. Peter's Basilica, a project he was lead architect on for the 17 years preceding his death in 1564. While the basilica wasn't completed until 1626, over 60 years after his death, Michelangelo's influence on the structure was immense, as he had laid out many plans for the structure during his lifetime, many of which were faithfully carried out under the reign of future popes and future architects. Michelangelo's fingerprints are all over modern Rome, and especially what is today Vatican City. Not only through his paintings, frescoes, and sculptures, but also through his architectural achievements. In addition to his influence on St. Peter's Basilica, Michelangelo also redesigned the famous Capitolini Hill area of Rome and designed many chapels within the walls of the Vatican. Michelangelo was also tasked with a number of pet projects over the years. These projects were not one that the man himself wanted to undertake, but was compelled to because of monetary considerations or simply loyalty to the Pope. For example, when Pope Julius II ordered him to construct a three times life-size bronze statue of the Pope, Michelangelo had no choice but to accept. The project took up more than two years of his life, and four years after its completion, the work was unceremoniously melted down to construct cannons. Additionally, the conditions under which he was made to work were often sorely substandard. For years, he lived and worked with four other men in a cramped apartment with little to no privacy and no room for his creative juices to flourish. It is interesting to imagine what a genius such as Michelangelo could have accomplished given reign over his own creativity. I personally believe the world is a poor place for him having not been allowed this luxury. However, on the other hand, perhaps Michelangelo's sometimes tortured life imbued his works of art with something more than just artistic genius. Although Michelangelo is a celebrated figure for his works of art and well-respected for his architectural acumen, his literary works are virtually unknown to the world. He was a virtuoso of Renaissance art, celebrated in his lifetime and venerated centuries after his death, but his writings never made an impact on the society in which he lived, nor in the years since. Michelangelo was an avid writer of poetry and found that poetry was an invaluable escape from the grind of his everyday work life, especially during the years spent arduously painting the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Poetry provided an outlet for his frustrations, fears, beliefs, and desires. Those who want to know the real Michelangelo must go beyond his frescoes and sculptures and dig deep into his personal writings. There, one will find a rather tortured soul, harmed by years of physical, political, professional, and personal strife. That is the end of section four. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Okay, students, so there is section four, and as you can uh, hear, there's no pause or break in section four. It's just one continuous presentation. Let's go through these answers together now. Just going to stop the audio on our website, and uh, we'll discuss these together. So here we go. We'll do this nice and quick. Um, let's do this. So this is a university lecture, and of course, those of you who are learning to do school in an English-speaking country, that's what you have to prepare for. That's a very typical kind of a lecture you could hear in an art history class or another class discussing famous painters or iconic uh, figures in culture, maybe sociology. All right, so here we go. It's the life of Michelangelo. Let's just get back to the first couple of questions here where the... Uh, Professor is on about some administrative information for the class. Uh, here you had to choose the letter A or B. So A if it's on the exam, B if it's not on the exam. Uh, this was very clearly stated. It was just kind of to get you prepared. So material from the third class of the week, is it on the exam or not on the exam? A or B, if you're guessing here, you still got a 50-50, so don't leave these blank. Um, the correct answer here was B. This is the last couple days will not be uh, on the exam. So B was the correct answer. Good for all of you who got that. Uh, number 32, if you don't know why, check the transcripts. 
So check the script in the back of the book. Okay, in our books, we always have that. Cambridge books have it too. Uh, I believe Barron's books have it as well. Uh, 32, material from the current class. So material from, is it? Yeah, very good. It's A, yeah, it's in the, um, it's in the exam. So current is in the exam. All right, so um, Michelangelo, the life and the works of Michelangelo, the famous sculptor, especially Italian sculptor. Um, other works, let's uh, talk about this. So while Michelangelo is perhaps most famous for painting the Sistine Chapel, he is also famous for a number of other highly respected works, including the Pieta, and the statue named something thought to symbolize male beauty. Yeah, David is um, absolutely the right answer here uh, because it's the male form, right? So, um, just this moment, yeah. So, David, and importantly, students, this is a name. So the D has to be big. If it's not a capital um, letter, then you get it wrong. So uh, the famous uh, David statue thought to symbolize male beauty. So David it is. Okay, capital D. Okay, let's keep going. Now for these, it is important that you try to read while you're answering. So architectural achievements... Uh, for more than, uh, more, far more than just a painter, Michelangelo was also an architect. He was lead architect on St. Peter's Basilica for something until his death in 1564. What was the correct answer there? Uh, and here you had to have two words, okay? Uh, and I believe it says uh, no more than two words, so pay attention to that, okay? All right, so 17 years, yeah, 17 years. If you want to make your sevens look really clear, do that little strike through, okay, 17 years. Of course, don't write the word 17. That takes too much time. Um, though the structure was not completed until 60 years after his death, his fingerprints are all over the resulting structure because future something and something faithfully carried out his design. So here it's two nouns and it's plurals. Okay. And what are those two nouns? Yeah, Samuel, very good. Popes and architects. So popes, popes is usually spelled with a capital P and architects. Now, if you spell this with a small p, they will probably give that to you anyway. But if you pay attention to uh, this, uh, these listening questions, you'll see that it's used with a capital P. So uh, pay attention to it. Okay, so popes and architects. Uh, Michelangelo's influence is also apparent around the rest of the city of... Where? Where do we see Michelangelo's work? So we see it in the Vatican because of... St. Peter's Basilica, but we also see it in other places in the city where the Vatican is. Where is the Vatican? The larger city of Rome. Yeah, Rome. Very good. So uh, if you pay attention here, you realize that uh, including at the ancient Capitolini Hill site, uh, Capitolini Hill is not uh, in the Vatican. It's uh, although a part of Rome. So that should be clear. Of course, Rome is the name of a city, so you definitely want the big R in that case, okay? All right, few more questions to go, and then we're there. So here we go. Uh, he was also a loyal servant of the Pope. And here you can see the capital P, even though it's at the end of the sentence, right? So uh, he was also a loyal servant of the Pope. Sometimes this was important work, though sometimes it was rather pointless. He once built a something of the Pope, only to see it melted down for cannon parts just a few years later. Uh, what was that? 
It was a bronze statue. Yeah. Bronze statue. Very good. Uh, moreover, the something he had to work in were often substandard, often being forced to live and work in small, cramped places with a number of other men. The next one. Yeah, Samuel, if you write just statue, you'll get that correct as well. So you don't have to have bronze, but bronze statue is the safer bet. Okay. Uh, conditions. Very good. Okay, so bronze statue or statue and conditions. It's because statue still makes sense is the answer, so they'll take something like that. Okay, two more questions. Literary works. It is interesting to think what he could have made if he was given the freedom to explore his own something. Uh, explore his own what? You can probably get this. Pawandeep says that's creativity. And creativity is correct, okay? Um, while his life may have been difficult, some people argue that this difficulty made him a better artist. Something was an important way to escape the difficulties of Michelangelo's life. Number 40 is clearly a noun. It was given to you a couple of times over. They wanted to uh, maybe finish on a lighter note in the listening here. And the correct answer is poetry. Very... Good, uh, Samuel, and Real Diamond, and Chevenne, and Bebek, and Sanya. Yeah, poetry. Very good. Okay. Uh, capital P is a good idea. It's the beginning of the sentence. Okay. It's always capitalized. So if you write a small letter, I'm not sure they'll give that to you. Okay, students, uh, how did you do? Uh, what was your score? And for those of you who made it through yesterday's kind of challenge in class because of the audio, uh, you can give me your score out of 40. So what was your score out of 40? Now I'll show you um, when you're practicing these uh, listening uh, sections at home, uh, what you can do is you can go to our website. I'm just going to darken up our screen here a little bit. Just bear with me. Okay. So you can go to our website and at the bottom of our uh, websites, both A Help and GL's Help, you have this uh, wonderful uh, score calculator. Uh, at the bottom. It's different for the general outs reading, so careful about that. Okay, so you click on that score calculator and then you'll get this screen where you see it says uh, listening here and academic reading and then you can input your raw score and get your band score. So if your raw score is Mohammed Azat, then you got 25 and you got a band score of 6. Okay. If you're Maxim Yun and you got 28, then you got a band score of 6.5. If you're Bebek Tamang and you got 35, then you got a band score of 8. Okay. Um, Real Diamond, 28 out of 40. We just had that. That was a 6.5. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, Jainil, 32. 32 would be a band score of 7.5. So that's quite good. Okay. Now, careful students with these live classes, um, the answers are a little bit easier because you're hearing me do explanations. And also, of course, I'm moving the exam uh, questions with the audio. So when you're doing it with me, it's a little bit easier to know your position in the audio because I'm obviously moving the questions. Okay, that's clear. So if you got 7.5 with me, chances are you might be closer to a 7. Everybody's clear on that? So if you get a 6.5 with me, chances are you're maybe a little bit closer to a 6. Just because you don't have that help of the moving questions with the audio. Okay, so if you lose yourself, you're going to lose points faster than with me. All right, hopefully that's clear. Okay, so be very careful at home, but it's really good practice, obviously. Okay, um, students, that's it for this class. Uh, to get all of our six full practice exams, interactive courses, lots and lots of videos, uh, go to aehelp.com for academic IELTS. Click the big red button to join the premium package. And gielshelp.com for general, you'll find speaking and writing help there too for editing and 
uh, speaking interview practice as well as other students to speak to. So lots of goodies there for you. Hi, Eugen. Thanks for all of the emojis. They always kind of brighten up and liven up that chat. My name is Adrian. I'm signing out from Budapest for today. Hopefully I'll see you tomorrow for speaking part two and speaking part three practice and strategy. Bye for now, everyone. Take care.